Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 32. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer. Today's conversation is really interesting. It's a roundtable discussion with Sam, along with a couple of her colleagues and some key personnel at the Halifax Wanderers Football Club, which if you don't know who they are, they are a Canadian professional soccer team competing within the Canadian Premier League uh, based in Halifax, right on the Wanderers grounds in the heart of the city. And they came together for this discussion for many reasons, but one of which is some of the recent partnerships that Dow has done with the Wanderers, particularly in the realm of hiring co-op students in recent years and months. But they've also gone into a bunch of other discussions in this episode uh, in terms of how how to find some passion in your career through giving back to your community and how that can lead to a lot of interesting experiences within your home community, but also abroad and around the world. They went to a bunch of different discussions about soccer uh, and soccer around the world and how there are varying experiences with soccer and sport depending on where you live and and often in terms of the racism that sometimes can be experienced, unfortunately. Um, I think this is a really interesting and eye-opening episode with a lot of really neat stories, sad stories, but also interesting ones to learn from uh, that I think you can take away from it. Uh, it's also they're also doing really cool things in the community through soccer. Uh, and if you haven't checked out a game on the Wanderers grounds, I've been to a few. They're a lot of fun, and I highly encourage you to check them out as well. Thanks, and enjoy this really interesting uh, and special roundtable episode. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. My name is Sam Taylor, and welcome to our podcast, our special Dalhousie and Wanderers crossover. Uh, My name is Sam Taylor. I'm senior instructor for the Rose School of Business, and I'm joined with me today, my co-host, my special co-host and co-faculty advisor, um, assistant professor Derek uh, from the Rose School of Business as well. I would like, before we get started in our podcast and introducing our guests, I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. All righty, so Derek, I gave you a brief intro, uh, your name, but how about you kick us off with a little bit more of a robust intro? So uh, yeah, I guess a little bit more of a robust intro. Yes, uh, we're colleagues. I also currently serve as the academic program director in the Rose School of Business, um, which means in terms of you know assessing our curriculum. So and going through those things and things like the topic of this as it relates to EDI is super important because we're all trying to do more in that space. And then of course, I have a particular interest in this topic as it pertains to sport as um, it is uh, something I use often in my teaching because it captures a great deal of experience um, and allows students to relate to things that they can see um, and many of them are fans. So it brings real issues and kind of captures a microcosm of a lot of society's problems and does that very well. And then of course, I'm also a very big fan of sport and more particularly um, a longtime fan of soccer um, and have played it for most of my life back when playing soccer was an unusual thing uh, for a kid with no kind of European or whatever heritage Although I had it, but it was not one of those known types. Um, so and and so I'm happy to be here to uh, to hear what everyone has to say. Perfect. Thank you, Derek. Cindy, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, Cindy Ryan, I work with Dahousie, uh, the Rose School of Business, uh, in particular with the Department of Management Career Services. Essentially, management career services means co-op office (laughs) for business, uh, anything related to business. So my role there is to support primarily Nova Scotia. However, there is a a manager on our team who supports the rest of Canada. So we do have placements all across Canada. And these are work integrated learning opportunities for our students. Uh, The Bachelor of Commerce program has a three mandatory co-ops, four months uh, duration. Uh, that they must complete in order to, you know, successfully meet the demands of this program. And uh, also there's a Bachelor of Management program and an MBA program, and they do an eight month or uh, internship as well. And so uh, my role is to work with Nova Scotia employers uh, to orientate them and support them with uh, recruitment and to educate them on co-op and graduate uh, recruitment and to pipeline them into 
uh, what it means to orientate a student into co-op and to hiring and to everything that it means and also to access funding. And so I met the Wanderers uh, in that whole uh, organic opportunity of reaching out and, and meeting uh, members of the team to orientate them and say, hey, let's, uh, let's get together and, and talk about uh, co-op. And uh, that was last summer. And uh, so I've been working with them ever since, and they've had uh, co-op since uh, 2021. And uh, we'll get into those different varieties of co-ops and so on later. But essentially, uh, I worked uh, in university for the last five or so years. And uh, outside of uh, working in university, I have an extensive background in nonprofit and government-related work. Uh, that's me, pretty much. Thank you so much, Cindy. And I just want to point out, um, in addition to that fantastic yet brief um, intro, that you were really the inspiration for this podcast and really, uh, you know, the driving force behind bringing us together as a collective. Your passion for cooperative education and work integrated learning really lines up with both mine and Derek's um, passion in order to, you know, show opportunities to, to students to kind of say, hey, listen, I see a bit of myself in these inspiring humans. Possibly maybe I can go chase after my dreams. Um, the goal of this channel is to empower management learners to make big goals and the confidence to chase after them. So when you mentioned um, that, you know, all of the different initiatives that you had been working on um, in our communities and your great connections, I am so, so thrilled to, um, to send the spotlight over to Marvin because um, I'm just so grateful that um, him and Jen, Jen Michael Williams are here with us today. So Marvin. Um, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Samantha. I really appreciate it. And uh, I also want to give a great shout out to Cindy um, for being the one to bridge us all together. She's, she's definitely somebody who's great at connecting and I really appreciate all the work we've been able to do um, in the last few years and, uh, and everything you do for Dow as well. Um, so my name is Marvin Otuki Okello. Um, I was initially born in Kenya and uh, I did end up going to Dalhousie as well and I've grown up in the soccer community here um, and through playing and being involved in the soccer community when I was younger um, I was lucky enough to be asked to uh, be the first ever brand ambassador for the Wanderers which then led to a full-time ticketing role um, which then led to a full-time retail and ticketing role, which then eventually led to uh, ticketing, retail and diversity equity inclusion officer. So done a little bit of everything and um, worked a lot with some of your co-op students, but um, really just happy to be part of an organization that allows myself and you'll hear from Jen that um, we're able to learn, um, share stories, share experiences and uh, align with uh, the great people in our community like um, yourself, Cindy, Samantha and Derek. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Marvin. All right. And last but certainly not least for the intros, Jan, um, you, I, I, you know, I almost hesitate to make you introduce yourself, but um, you're here and everybody else had to. So um, would you perhaps want to introduce yourselves and uh, give this lazy host a moment to recollect her thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, guys. Um, good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is John Michael Williams, uh, former youth and senior international for the Trent Tobago men's national football team, or as you say, kind of soccer team. Um, I've played over 80 times for the national senior team, played a youth on the 17 World Cup with international stars like uh, Andres Iniesta, Carlos Tevez, just to name a few. Um, and now um, I'm at the Wanderers, uh, goalkeeping coach and assistant coach. Um, just here and, and happy to be on this podcast to, to just share information, thoughts, ideas, and have conversations about topics that um, I think the world needs to hear. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, just hearing uh, Marvin and Jen yourselves uh, introducing yourselves, one thing that I couldn't help but kind of bridge together and something that I would love for our management learners to kind of really capture is Marvin, you held a number of roles and um, something tells me that they weren't all given to you. Similarly, 
Uh, Jan, you held a number of progressive <laughs> um, experiences in soccer, including uh, goalkeeper and now goalkeeper coach um, for the Wanderers. And then doing a little bit of background research, am I correct that when you were the goalkeeper coach, you actually came back and you were the goalkeeper to fill in when somebody got injured. Is that correct? <laughs> oh, um, um, when you when you fall in love with, with something or someone, it's very difficult to turn your back on it. Um, I've actually retired three times on two separate occasions. <laughs> and the Wanderers seems to, they seem to just keep bringing me back, you know. Um, and, and since I've been here, from the inception 2019, I think um, I, I fell in love with the club, with the, with the culture, with the community, and with the city. So I guess anytime the Wanderers ask, I'll always be there just to, to, to come back and to fill in. So yes, you, you, you're very correct in saying that. Yeah, they, right. they, they brought me out every time. <laughs> so, you know, if we can talk about anything, we always like to, you know, point out failures. Um, so, you know, some of us fail in different ways. Some of us fail in retirement, right? And sometimes... <laughs> 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 oh, wow. All right, but actually, what I really want to point out uh, to our management learners is that life is not linear. And I, you know, I, my podcasts aren't linear, life isn't linear, but we often think, you know, I know I definitely did at 18, 19, I felt like it was a very stepwise path. If I do X, I will get Y and it's step by step by step. And, um, you know, I came from um, a very modest um, background um, to, to working parents um, working in retail and you know, they were like, go to university. That is, that is the path. And so I went and I was about to graduate and I was like, what, what's the next step? Like, this is what you do. What, what's next? And so, you know, I had to, and they were there along the way to bounce ideas off of, but figure out what is the next step. So in both of your stories, I you know, really want to highlight that it doesn't sound like there's a quote next step. And that sometimes it can be, you know, the steps are all over the place. And sometimes they, the steps look like the last step and then the next step and the back step. So, you know, Jan, I believe that we capture that with you. Uh, Marvin, I just want to turn it over to you and just ask you, you know, how can we integrate your experience with both? How did you kind of quote, get those opportunities, I would use the word, earn those opportunities or make those opportunities. And how does that kind of relate to the various management skills that management learners might be able to connect with? Definitely. And um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you use the word failure and so, you know, a few times because I really resonate with that word in a positive way, because in a lot of times it's seen as a negative, um, but I haven't been afraid to fail. Um, so like one of my mentors, um, Paul Byrne, who's the, who was the first EPL president, who I've been lucky enough to have a mentorship relationship with him, um, and it was lucky to have a podcast with him. And he had over 48 jobs um, before he eventually um, was able to be on the team that launched MLSE, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, which was the Raptors, um, uh, Toronto FC and everything. And I've, I'm similar. I've been able to have jobs, um, leave jobs. I, I, was, I was fired from one job because I was watching soccer on the job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was it a soccer job or were you watching like another team? <laughs> I was watching a game. I was working actually at, at Oh My Soul um, on Young Street. And um, there was honestly, there's nothing to do. So I, I streamed I one of the it. games. And Good. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, um, I'll stop interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. And um, so I, I've been willing to, you know, put my best foot forward. And that moment is you know, obviously a little distracted with watching footy, but that's that's a passion of mine, like, like Jan said in his intro. And that's, you know, kind of led to me now working for a professional soccer team. But in relation to the management students, you know, you have to be willing to try. Um, and trying sometimes means you fail. Some, trying sometimes means you succeed. Trying sometimes means you hover somewhere in between those two. And I've definitely learned that over the years and I'm continuing to try different things. Um, so I really resonate with the challenges that come with, um, you know, being a management student specifically, you know, you have to be um, multi willing to multitask and you have to have multiple skills. Um, and the big thing is just being open to learn, take a learn from everything that you do in the community and your family and school and in in every environment you're put in. So yeah.
I, I guess I'll, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to ask Marvin, you know, which game got you fired? Um, <laughs> it was an Arsenal game. I'm an Arsenal fan. <laughs> wow. I yeah, well, sometimes if you're an Arsenal fan like me, there's games you should turn off and not watch. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have we'll have lots to talk about it at a future time kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, and I have a question for you in the coaching and the transition and the retiring. So when you came to Halifax, because obviously there's a, you know a shelf life for playing professional, and that did you come with the idea that you thought you would transition into coaching? Um, it, did it open up? Was there an intention and a conversation about how that might work? Because I think one of the fascinating things about sports is that transition from being an athlete to fulfilling different roles and where that might lead because so many players careers end young in that sense. Um, I've had the opportunity to to be coached by some of the best coaches that have ever coached the game. Um, Stephen Hart being one of them. Um, I've had the likes of Francisco Maturana from Colombia. Uh, uh, so many coaches. Leo, Leo Benhaka, who actually took us to the World Cup. Um, the Dutchman. Um, so many names. But all of them seem to always urged me to take up coaching after I retired. Um, I, I guess they saw something that I didn't, but every coach I've had, every single one, Rene Simo is from Brazil. Um, they always kind of pushed me in that direction. And um, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was lucky enough to, to be somebody who had parents who actually taught me that I should, you know, I should listen to people <laughs> that are older than me and smarter than me and wiser than me. So it was really, I was one that always used to take advice. It was easy to give me advice. And, and, and I was always one to be open to taking positive advice. And um, while playing the game, I actually did a number of coaching courses. Um, in saying that, I just graduated uh, doing my Canadian B license uh, in February. I just completed it uh, last month. But when I came to Halifax, I had no intention of retiring. Um, in, in my personal opinion, I think, uh, I didn't have the season that would have led me to being nominated for CONCACAF goalkeeper of the year on two separate occasions. And I was kind of disappointed. But as I said, I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the team. I fell in love with the organization. And I really felt like I wanted to contribute. Um, when Stephen came to me after the season, and we spoke about the season that I had and about um, my thoughts, I actually had offers on the table. Um, I had a, a big contract on the table to go to Saudi Arabia. And as I said, at, for me at that point, it, it wasn't really about money. It wasn't about anything else but love. I really love the city. I really love the team. And um, the transition was, 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 for me, it was effortless because I was always that type of player. I was always that type of person who would help and who would try to, 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 to pass positive information and good coaching tips and ideas onto the younger ones. Um, so much so it kind of led Christian to Christian Oxner, that is to be in, in my opinion, one of the best goalkeepers in the country. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't much of a conversation that was had. I didn't have thoughts of retiring. But as I said, after the season that I had the first year, I really wanted to give back. And after the season, I start with uh, Stephen Hart. We had a discussion and, and it, it was, as they say, the rest was history after that. Yeah, cool. And I mean, and just, I could see the relation, I, I mean, just in terms of because you were such a senior player and Christian was obviously very young when they started that you yeah. would have had to have that mentoring uh, capacity given the nature of the league. So it looks, you know, that I'm, that I'm happy that the conversation was positive and it's worked out really well. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, funny story about Christian, I remember. <laughs> he was mentioning this to me the other day. Um, he said it was the first time he had trained with somebody that level, of, that, that high level of professional, which was myself. And I have a bad habit that I don't really drink water throughout the entire training session. So it could be hour and a half, two hours. I never take a sip of water. And, and, and just the other day, we were having a conversation and he was like, bro, I remember the first year you came in. And I was just looking at you like, is this guy crazy? 
is this how professionals are? This guy is not even drinking water. And I'm like, yo, professionalism is about you doing the things that work for you. It's not about doing the things that work for somebody else. I say, so if you sit, if you sat there for the entire 2019 and tried not to drink water, dehydrated yourself, that was on you. That wasn't on anybody else. Just, just a funny story. But yeah, um, it was, it was, it was, it was good work. Well, it is good working with the team, with the organization. And, and for me, as I said, it was, it was, it was effortless. It was seamless the transition because I, I was always told from from jump that I was that type of person, that type of individual that would always pass good information on, and I was always a student of the game. So I guess coaching was always in the books for me. Thank you. Hey, it's um, really interesting that you said something really key there that said professionalism means something different um, to, to different people. And I really wanted to highlight that, uh, you know, being my experience is uh, as a young female in, I started working in oil and gas in Calgary about 15 years ago. And some people would tell, you know, you not to do, you know, wear pink or not to do this. And, you know, throughout your career, you kind of are told, hey, this is what professional looks like, or this is, you know, how people who are professional talk or act. So for our management learners, a lot of times they feel like they need to, you know, pretend to be something they aren't and they need to, you know, act more professional or act more mature. And I, you know, so like kudos to you. This is how professionals act because I'm a professional and I'm here versus trying to fit into a mold. And that is something that is universal and really needs to just stand out. You want to wear pink, you wear pink. You want to wear black and gray, wear black and gray. Like it is all good. And that kind of spans everything. Uh, so with that, I would love to just circle back to Marvin and talk a bit more about, so we see the coaching side and we see the transitions and we see that, you know, if you plan out life, you're going to miss out on some pretty flipping cool opportunities. Would that be correct? Oh, 100%, 100%. And, um, you know, I, am, I actually opened up my um, career in life management uh, binder from grade 10 um, before this call, just to kind of see um, how much has changed um, since that time when I had to, you know, you, you have to pick your top interests. And then based on those, they put you into um, careers that they think you'll land in. And, and it was a really good exercise, actually, at the time, you know, to kind of put some perspective and see how things evolve and change over the years. And, and at that time, my, my top skills were, um, I was artistic, which to me meant writing um, and, and, and reading because I, I do a lot of poetry. I've, I've done poetry since I was about 13 years old. I've written over 140 poems since that time. Um, and my second one was um, connecting and networking. So that to this day, um, that one still definitely applies. I'm not artistic at all, really, anymore outside of outside of writing poetry. I'm like, I'm really surprised actually that was one that I put as number one, but it was grade 10. I was I was 14, and I guess that was that was relevant to me at that point. Um, and then the third one was um, management and team management skills. And you know, that again is still very relevant to this day. Um, and all that is just to say that, like, you know, you have to be willing to evolve. Um, you have to be willing to grow. You have to be willing to change um, to be professional. And and adding to your point about how that looks different for everybody, um, you know, following International Women's Day and Black History, you know, I've been on a lot of calls um, and taking courses that have touched on both those points and how professionalism looks very different for different cultures, different genders. You know, there's there's black women who have been told, you know, you can't have your hair braided, that doesn't look professional. And, you know, you can't have your hair curly or down. And, you know, I'm really glad to see that culture shift now where um, we're not telling women how to wear their hair. We're not telling people how to dress up or what colors not to wear. Cause I'll be honest, I'm colorblind. I'm blue green colorblind and pink is not pink to me. You know? <laughs> like it's, 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 so it's even that is, 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 is hilarious to hear from me, but, but no, um, I have been lucky to, you know, I started working at the theaters was one of my first jobs after doing the whole mowing lawns and shoveling driveways and all that, like the classic Nova Scotian, you know, a junior high and high school student, which led to me eventually working at Tim Hortons, which led to me working at Cardbon, um, racing the indoor go karting place. I worked um, as a soccer coach. I also have my community coaching licenses for child, youth, senior. Um, I have worked 
various jobs at which have really made it so that when I've gotten into this position here, um, I'm very well rounded and I, and I do some work in accounting. I do ticketing deposits and financial deposits for our team and for the league. Um, I do marketing in terms of idea creation, um, marketing for season tickets, marketing for community events. Um, I'm involved in the hiring practices and with Dave Finlayson, I'm talking about co-op students that are coming through the funnel with Cindy and, and once they actually land here, being able to work with them on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we give them a lot of different learning opportunities. Um, and we've had some great co-op students from Dal and, and Cody um, was one great one we had. Cameron was another one we had. Currently we have this one, Dylan Kiefer, who's doing a great job in the office. Um, so we really do value being able to teach them to be, um, you know, have a wide range of skills, you know, and adaptive because the business world is not linear, like you said, Samantha. And it's important to have that adaptability and um, the capacity for growth and change. Um, so that's something that's really served me well in my career. And, and I'm, I know I'm not in my last role with the team. Um, I, I hopefully eventually want to switch over to to join Jan in the football side, and I'm looking to get some of my coaching licenses, and hopefully that's written in the stars. But uh, but it's all about just being willing to learn, being willing to change, willing to put in that extra time and effort, and uh, who knows where you'll end up. Fantastic. And with all that experience and with your evolving roles within uh, the Wanderers, I just, I would love for you to spend just a few more moments and explain kind of how it looks, because what I anticipate is, is that there wasn't a job posting, uh, you're, you know, you're not working at the Wanderers and then a job posting comes up for the next job and you apply for it and you sit through an interview. It's more, I anticipate more organic than that, more even perhaps you're even doing the job and then you get the title for the job. So part one of that is, could you talk a bit about how to move up in an organization, um, especially one that's fluid and dynamic and that has that room for growth, um, that kind of startup feel. And the second is um, how did the, your current role come to be uh, and, and how are you finding that in your, with your, um, within your current role? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, definitely a lot of our positions are organic and, you know, in this special off season, we've all had a, we've, there's been a few changes from, you know, Jan eventually was a player and now being a coach. Uh, Matt Fegans used to be venue operations and football operations. Now he's just football operations. Um, I started initially um, being hired as a brand ambassador by um, a former teammate, actually, Jamie McGinnis, who was our first uh, VP of sales and marketing. And we played together at uh, United uh, Dartmouth for a senior men's team. And he, we had stayed in touch and he knew that I was doing some community work in terms of coaching and volunteering. And he's like, I think you're the perfect person who's played soccer, who's great with kids, who's very connected in the, in the, in the community um, to be our first ever brand ambassador. And I was at the time managing the Mahone Bay Quality Footwear Shoe Stores and helping them expand to uh, a couple new locations. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. You know, and, and so I did uh, the launch that we had um, with the Wander Selects versus Dusseldorf, which was our first ever game when we were still operating under the sports entertainment uh, Atlantic umbrella. And then um, after that, Jamie's like, I need to get you more involved. There has to be something for you, to, you know, we can get. And they were doing this conversion from everybody who gave these $50 deposits to eventually become season ticket holders. And he's like, how would you like to be, you know, contracted to you reach out to a lot of these people you probably know in the community to see if they're interested in being, you know, season ticket holders. And um, there was a team of four of us who did it. Myself, Denai Yatru, um, who's hired on for community, um, Dylan Lawrence, who's um, hired for marketing and um, Santiago, uh, who was just contracted as well. And that just shows the Wanderers willingness to hire people from different departments to do a similar task um, using those different skills. And after about a couple of weeks of um, the, you know, the four of us making calls to all these people to make deposits, I had sold as many season tickets as the rest of them combined. Um, so <laughs> I was, I was offered, uh, the, the position to eventually just be the sole ticket guy, the ticket sales guy. And I was left with the decision. Do I want to leave my home Bay quality footwear, which I'd worked hard to get into this management role, or do I want to leave and, you know, commit myself to a passion of mine? And it was, it wasn't a hard decision to make. So, um, I put in my, my two weeks and, um, 
I was the ticket sales uh, manager initially, and eventually we had to launch a retail store. So they were like, you know, you just left the retail world. Um, it would be really great if you help us um, get this off the ground. And so I was involved in hiring. Um, once we locked down that space in the Halifax Shopping Center, um, I went and I had experience, you know, displaying product and everything. So I I spent a couple of days and one night overnight making sure that the store looked good and we had our POS systems ready um, and we had the staff ready. We were ready to go essentially for our big uh, our big store launch and and I was managing that for a good six months until it eventually became. Um, very clear that that role needed somebody specific to do the retail role and the ticketing role in season was was definitely um, a full time job so I shed I shed the retail role. Um, I'd say 75% of it, but I was still involved in, in some aspect and uh, and then eventually when when George Floyd passed away um, or died, I should say, unfortunately. Um, and the world was seeing it I really dug deep and and. I was I was tired of just being a witness to the things like that happening in the world and feeling like there's nothing we could do about it. Um, so I really, you know, searched inside, spoke to my family, and you know, came to the realization that we have a platform at the Wanders. We have a huge following. We have all over twenty thousand followers on social media, and this was a real opportunity to um, champion a position that was going to bring awareness about these things that are happening in the world so i sent an email to our entire staff saying listen this is how i'm feeling um this is the research that i've done zooms launched a diversity officer and um, i want to be that position i'll do it on top of my role if need be um, but this is something that's important to me and should be important to our organization and luckily derek um, agreed and everyone is in full support and um, i've really I've really been given, you know, autonomy in that position to 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 continue learning and and sharing my learnings with everybody in in the group. And um, I really can't thank, like I said, Derek and and everyone enough for being having the faith in me and, and the trust in me. Um, so that is, you know, my current roles. I started off as diversity and inclusion officer was the title, um, and then eventually we realized after I started the committee, um, which is five men, five female for all walks of life in the community, um, we realized that we were missing, you know, the equity piece, which was evolving um, aspect of it in, in that space. And then recently we added Nicole Durant, um, who is now helping us with the accessibility piece, which is something that is really missed a lot when you hear DEI. Um, accessibility is, is sometimes missed. And that's not just physical accessibility, but that's also financial accessibility, which a lot of the management students would be very aware of. So, so yeah, that's just the long, uh, long version of how <laughs> it got into my current role. Thank you. It's very nice to receive, you know, passion, uh, talent, skills, and, you know, being able to make that, you know, make opportunities for yourselves and also add value, right. And kind of see, see that come to life and, you know, definitely, um, I assume. I suspect some of our management learners can connect specifically with that and perhaps in their own way and think about how can they make a difference in the world, um, you know, similar, um, similar to you. So thank you. I, I was just going to, you know, build on the comments that Samantha made and Marvin made in terms of trying to highlight, especially for listeners, is that so many of people who create success in an organization, there's not a playbook for it and that they're sort of seeing what a need is and then jumping in and that, and then you're asking, you know, you're saying, I wanna do this. And then you're asking for help getting it done. You're not looking upward to a owner or manager saying, what should I do? And that typically managers don't wanna hear, what should I do? They want to hear someone saying, I think we should do this and in a way that creates a dialogue. And so the idea might not be the best idea that comes forward, but the derivative from the conversation normally creates some really good ideas. And that that is a skill and something that 
in all of, you know, and, and, and even again, it sort of fails in the same way if someone's saying you would be good at this and just going forth and, and kind of exploring that experience and developing from it. And so when you put forth those ideas, they may not be the best ideas. And obviously some of yours were very good, Marvin, but there's that, there's lots that don't work, but the conversations and the initiative, yeah, some of them will fail, but the conversations that'll create will create the idea that actually works. And too often, I think people hold back on those and then they, they wait for the perfect instructions and the guideline and those aren't there. Um, and if, because if they were there, everyone would have done that already. So I, I think as, as trying to summarize that answer and what, you know, listeners could take from it, that that's a, a, a very good story that highlights that. Definitely. And, and, and just to kind of add a little point is uh, we've all heard of people creating uh, the positions that they want, you know, or they, they think are needed. And that's something that's so, so true, you know, and, and you never know what people will say, bosses and, and partners alike, um, if you just do the work, do the research and then present a case. Absolutely. So given that Cindy really is our liaison between the classroom and real life, right? I, I like to think I am, um, but this really is Cindy's. This is what you do all day, every day with dedication and passion as you talk to employers, you talk to candidates, uh, you know, students at Dal. So Cindy, I would like to ask you, um, Derek and I are both the co-faculty advisors for the Rose Sports Business Society, which it's a, our business students, and you can be passionate about sports, playing sports, sport management, um, watching sports, or all of them, or two of them. So a number of our students who may be listening here will be management students, but a, a smaller subset might be the Rose Sports Business Society. What advice would you have for you know students at Dal who are looking to get you know to really add value to the wanderers in either a volunteer or perhaps you know a career or kind of contribute in some way and we can make this general too so that we don't crash uh, Marvin's inbox <laughs> with applications so it's, you know sports sports management um, either specific to the wanderers or general um, to adding to our wonderful sports community here in Halifax what are your thoughts Thanks, uh, Samantha. I would, I'd like to share a bit of data first, if I could, um, to answer that question. I think it's always best for the wanderers to answer the question on how it's best to, to, to support them uh, and how they might want to see that support. Uh, yeah, definitely what I would do is probably uh, touch base with Marvin, say, hey, let's get connected with the president of the, the society. They have a conversation about what the st students' you know, interests availability. But I think, uh, yeah, there is many aspects of uh, the Wanderers in terms of their community outreach and their programming and how they do, uh, you know, they have a, a fan club. They have many different types of, of, of ways to engage with the community. So having said that, um, yeah, I'm sure uh, an association like theirs would have, uh, you know, paid opportunities for co-op, uh, graduate opportunities, obviously, as they evolve. And then, you know, volunteering opportunities, which, uh, you know, just, you know, this month, uh, March is, uh, you know, uh, basically dedicated to Will, which is Work Integrated Learning and Cooperative Education, and uh, National Sea Well Canada, which is an organization that promotes awareness. Uh, this is a, you know, co-op and, and National Work Integrated Learning Month, March is. Uh, and the actual national day is March 23rd. If you want to students shout out on your LinkedIn, uh, you know, get out there and shout out, you know, the importance of working on your learning. And if I give, you know, you know, when you ask specifically with the uh, Wanderers, uh, some of the roles that they have been doing, uh, just, you know, to give some context there, is I've, I've pulled uh, some of the job descriptions uh, and the, the titles. And so uh, the job titles would be uh, sales and partner support co-op, uh, co uh, business development and marketing, uh, administrative assistant and account associate. So these are some of the roles that they've had, four different roles over the last year and a half that our students have filled successfully. Uh, and uh, so, and just, you know, to add to that, like uh, in terms of sports and recreation as, a, as, a, as an entire industry, 
uh, we have, and I pulled some data of the last three years, so that would be nine uh, work, you know, work terms uh, over the last three years. And so what that data looks like, uh, just so everybody knows, is uh, we worked with 126 organizations uh, within the Rose School of uh, Management, and uh, we posted 112 positions. 74 of those positions were in Nova Scotia. Uh, 34 were in Ontario. I only asked to pull the data for those two provinces. However, we do have, uh, you know, positions in other provinces. And, uh, you know, the, out of those positions that was hiring, we've, we've got about 45 hires and uh, the Wanderers hired four of those positions. And so when I, uh, you know, just to kind of expand a little bit on your question, uh, not directly just to, you know, uh, the Wanderers, there are many opportunities because it's not just the Wanderers. We, we're talking about, if I, I look at the cross segment of 126, op, you know, organizations that posted, uh, and uh, then we're engaged with our uh, co-op in the last three years, uh, those would be associations. So every association from basketball, tennis, golf, hockey, sailing, uh, you know, tennis, volleyball, the, you know, the list goes down. Uh, these are national associations as well as provincial associations. Uh, there's societies. So there's uh, groups of societies within different organizations that are forming. Uh, we're doing, there's some exciting work that's gonna be happening in this summer. So summer co-op students, please look at my career because uh, there is championships, there's world championships under 22 uh, in baseball and sailing. Um, Benuk Club has a, a national, you know, uh, you know, opportunity and great going on. So there's many, many things um, in the area of sports and recreation and also like some of our, uh, you know, associations. So recreation departments uh, like the Canada Games Center, like the Sackville uh, Sports, you know, Association, different uh, centers and, and are also offering opportunities for management. And so, you know, you could do a finance position, you know, in a nonprofit organization working for sport. I mean, you, you really need, you know, your accounting students might even look at this like, well, you know, what's really in it for me in sports? Well, there's lots. You can work for an organization that uh, you're benefiting their books and supporting them, um, you know, and also benefiting by uh, working in sport. So I know I kind of well, went around that a little bit, but I just wanted to, um, you know, show the depth uh, and the variety of opportunities that are present and, and available to the students. Definitely. And sports are entangled in everything, like you said there, from, from marketing to sales to um, social media, which is obviously a huge driver of, of revenue now um, in today's world. And, and that's the beauty of a school like Dalhousie, which has a ton of international students. That's, that's what pulled me to Dalhousie when I was deciding where to go, um, was seeing that there was a Caribbean society. There's, there's all these opportunities to interact with people from all around the world. And, um, and that's the beauty of, of, of globalization, you know, is, is the world has been made a lot smaller now because of um, planes being able to take you to different countries, um, social media, you can scroll through and an ad while you're in Trinidad shows up for the Halifax Wanderers or Dalhousie and you're like, what is this? And you can just, you, know, you have access now to things all around the world, which, which lead to making the world seem like it's much smaller than what it is. And we've all heard that statement said a, a lot of times that um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a big world, it's, it's a very small world. And I think it gets smaller and smaller with the implementation of technology, um, with social media, with computers, laptops. Um, you know, now that it's, it's, it's more expensive to buy a cell phone than it is a laptop. <laughs> and uh, I think that says a lot about the direction we're going and that, that we've gone. And, and, you know, Jan, Jan knows um, as somebody who's traveled the world a lot, um, just how small the world can feel. So I'll, I'm going to ask, yeah, and I'll follow up on that question. I was just going to reiterate what, what Cindy sort of said about the small sport organizations. And I think that sometimes what students forget about a small organization, be it sport or otherwise, is that that position for direct market or, or finance really means that's going to be what you're hired for, but your job's going to be all things in the organization and you're going to get a holistic experience of having to do a whole bunch of stuff and likely if you go work for the wanderers that may involve being the mascot because i understand almost every employee's had to be it except for derek um and 
And so that that opportunity is something that you don't get in sometimes big organizations where your tasks can be very small and focused. And that even happens in sport. I know speaking to a former basketball coach who was talking about, you know, college recruitment, it was getting to the point where no one was developing players. They were just going recruit a number four, just recruit a four. And they have a very set box. And they were really actually amazed when they go play kind of in the, one of the minor pro leagues that how bad the basketball players were because they'd just been taught how to do one thing and they didn't have a holistic sense of the game. So they didn't have like a full game. And so those little organizations allow the same thing. Um, and I guess to turn over to Yan, because we talked about globalization is you've been a player in, you know, almost Saudi Arabia, you've traveled the world as a youth into different places. I think you spent some time in Belgium and then you went to kind of England and then I think you ended up back in Belgium, but then in England and the two different clubs, probably one or two other stops that you may not have wanted to put on your Wikipedia page because it's like, ah, I can't believe I showed up and they promised me something um, and it didn't quite happen to be. Um, and so about that experience of what you've seen in, you know, the changes in sport. And I would think that, you know, from the small world, the friendships, then even also the changes from the, you know, the amount of activism that, you know, went from the highlights of, of the 60s, when you look at kind of um, the stance on the Olympic podium, uh, you look at Muhammad, like, so that one too is a very strong point where athletics is very political to actually sort of the unpolitical. And now we're back where there's a, so many more stronger messages too. So if you want to share a bit on that journey in the different places and roles that you played in all that, that would be a wonderful story to hear. Um, the issues were always there, you know, to be fair, the issues were always there. Um, sexism, racism, uh, everything was there. I think when Marvin spoke a bit about the introduction of technologies, making the world a smaller place, it is actually helping everybody to it's actually open their eyes. Things that we would not have been able to see, uh, even a, a situation like George, George Floyd, things that we would not have been able to see. I remember when I was younger, there was a situation that took place with Rodney King. And I, I used to tell myself, had that happened in 2021 or 2022, a lot more people would have had a detailed understanding through seeing it for themselves, what had happened. And I, 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 honestly, I, from my understanding, the only thing that was different from Rodney King and the George Floyd incident was that George Floyd died, you know? Um, I have been both fortunate and blessed enough to be everywhere on the planet. Um, I've played football in over 100 countries. And I, I love the fact that I've gotten the opportunity to see the best of the, those countries, but also to see the worst of those countries. Um, for me, I think those situations have, have helped me to develop as an individual, to know what, what I want and what I don't want for myself, for my family, for my peers, for the people around me for the organization for Wanderers and for the, for the organizations and the teams that I've worked and played for. Um, when it comes to my time in Europe, in Belgium, in England, and I spent some time in Eastern Europe as well, I spent some time in Hungary, um, those experiences were eye-opening to me. Um, it taught me to understand something as simple as body language, because I was in, in Hungary when Rosetta Stone wasn't teaching Hungarian. <laughs> so it was difficult for me to learn the language. So I had to sit back and I had to really look at, at, at everyone around me, look at their tone, not necessarily what they were saying because I couldn't understand the language, but to look at their tone, their body language and to try to, to, to get some, some sense of understanding through that. Um, I remember I had one player who, when I signed with a club in, 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 in Hungary, Ferenc Varos, um, a team in Budapest. After about 
after about a month and a half, I noticed that he was in the locker next to mine, that he just, he wasn't there anymore. I wasn't seeing him at practice about two or three weeks past. And I had this one player who was Hungarian, but he was actually, when he was like about four or five, he left Hungary and he went to England and he grew up in London. And then he came back when he was a little bit older. So he knew how to speak English and he grew up outside of, of, of Hungary, outside of uh, Budapest. And he was my friend and I spoke to him and I asked him one day, I was like, what, why, why did this player move? Like, where is he going? Was, has he transferred to another club? What has happened to him? And he said to me, playing, and, and, and what, what I liked about him, he was brutally honest. He said, um, his family and the area he grew up in, they won't allow him to, to be in a club that has a black player, let alone sit next to a black man in a dressing room. And that was the message for me. It, that, that was eye-opening because where I come from in Trinidad here, we believe that there's some level of racism, um, but the racism here, because the country is, is predominantly uh, people from Africa and people that came from, Indra, from India. So the Africans came through slavery and the East Indians came after slavery was abolished to do what, what was known as indentured laborership. And the level of racism that I saw in, in Europe, it was so, it was so bad. I have to be honest. It was so bad. When I came back to Trinidad, I was like, guys, like, we need to stop this. Like, because it doesn't make sense. Because when you go and you get exposed, we were talking about globalization to different parts of the world and to different situations. You could either use it to do two things. You could use it to make you a better person or you could use it to help you to grow and to help grow the people, the environment, everything around you. So I've always tried to, 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 to do the latter. And as I said, some people would have, I had, I had players there, I had some African players, some players from Senegal and, and, and Sierra Leone who were there and they left, they went back home after the season. I, I was eager to, halfway through the season, sorry, I was eager to stay on because I felt like me doing well and me being successful would have opened so much more doors and would have connected so much more and given information to so much more people who didn't have the knowledge, who didn't have the cell phone and who didn't have social media and all these things to teach them, well, hey, it's okay to be friends with a black person. It's okay to be, you know, to, to have a black teammate, to have somebody sit next to you in a dressing room. Everybody's human, you know? So these experiences have really helped me to learn and to grow. And I, I cherish every single one of them. I've been to Japan. I've seen, I've seen situations there. I've been to Paraguay. I, I, I remember sitting in the airport in Paraguay as soon as we got in and kids walking up to us and asking us in Spanish to touch our hair because they've never seen hair like that before. You know, and, and, and again, it's important for, it was important for me to try to, to ensure that the experiences that these people were having were good experiences, because I don't think there's a, actually, I know this, there's not a bad race or a bad creed or, or, or color of person. There are only people who lack knowledge and information, who we seem to be, or who we deem to be bad people, and people who have knowledge and information and, and those people are, are the good people, you know? So people who know and who have experienced and who were taught that it's okay to be, to, to, it doesn't matter the color of the skin or the color of the hair or the color of the eyes. Those are, those are the good people. And, and people who don't know, they just lack knowledge. So the knowledge I have gained throughout my travels, I just always try to pass it on and always try to be, to be a good person. Always try to, 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 to interact with good people. And even if I see people who, we can, who I consider the bad people, I try to educate them. Because for me, it's about how you treat people at the end of the day. It's about how you interact with them. It's about being a good person. That's the most important thing. So again, I would, I would always treasure all my experiences, all the places I've traveled. Um, and again, it's just about learning, growing, developing yourself and trying to develop the people around you. I just thanks for sharing all of that and um because you know when I looked in all the places you played I was wondering about the Hungary experience and and because I once shared a train with an African-American 
during uh, the World Cup, who'd been through Hungary, and her mm-hmm. experience was how horrific it was. Um, <laughs> and so I was, was hoping bad. in terms of, 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 of that, and I'm not sure how we ended up at the Romania game in, you know, Bordeaux, but we ended up on a train for a long time. And I, I but I, I just remember that story of her telling me what that was like in, in that I- experience. And so to hear as someone who lived it in much more intensely, not as a tourist, um, really sheds a light on, on just how much, how that challenging all of that was. And then how, to some extent, being a good pro in that positive sense of like fulfilling and being the best self, despite probably all the energy it would have taken and energy that you shouldn't have to use in all those situations is, is an important, um, you know, is a super important thing. And, and I think for, you know, for people to hear the challenges that people go through to it, you know, to make a difference and attain their goal. Yeah. For those who don't know about Rodney King, too, just because you, you know, you threw out the name there. He was one of the first victims of police brutality. And uh, I was. uh, Yeah. I mean, and I remember like that. I remember seeing the highlights of uh, CNN was in the year and there was around the Iraq war, like all within a year. And I remember actually being an undergrad and just being confused as hell as what was going on. And and, um, without I mean because you know it was at a point where you 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 know started to realize that warren moon who was playing for edmonton eskimos was only playing in the cfl because in the states they didn't you know they didn't think a quarterback could be black and like so the 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 idea around like it's just it's loud like i'm it's it's kind of it's so that that message about how long that history went back um you know i mean i yeah, Bulls on Parade shouldn't be a current contemporary song, yet it somehow remains. So that's a, you know, a frightening, a frightening thing. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear about how that challenge to some extent was overcome um, in terms of, or live through. I don't think it's fully been overcome if you watch the Euros this summer in Hungarian fans. <laughs> <laughs> Very sad. Um, yeah. I, I j- just touch it on Hungary again. Um, and some people might say my time in Hungary was, was, was some time back. But last year, I did an interview, one of the few interviews I've done um, around Trinidad and Tobago football because here it's been bad in terms of how they've been playing and, and, and so on. But that's another topic. And strangely enough, I had a woman reach out to me um, on all my social media, on, on, on Instagram, on Facebook. And I kept looking at, I thought it was somebody trying to, you know, these people try to steal money and all, all the cyber crime and whatnot. And eventually I gave her a, a, a hearing and she gave me a number to call her and I called her. And she said she was glad that I, 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 I accepted to speak to her. And she saw the interview that I did last year. And she was trying to remember my name for a long time, since I left Hungary in 2010, uh, 2009, 2010. And she said, I did an interview after about talking about the experiences in Hungary and whatnot. And she was going crazy trying to look for the interview to find it and she couldn't find it. And then the interview I did last year came up and then she remembered the name and whatnot. And funny enough story, she, a Trinidadian guy went to Hungary. He went to university. He met a nice lady. Uh, blue eyes, blonde hair, white lady. And they hooked up, they got married and he brought her back to Trinidad. And she spent some time in Trinidad. She made a baby and then COVID happened. And at the beginning of last year, she finally made her way back to Hungary. And it was the first time her baby um, had been to hungry so he's about two years or three years old now and she said present day in in the schools in the play park everywhere people are calling her sellout and how could she have a kid with a black person and they don't want to teach her the, the teachers in the school don't want to teach her son and this lady is in tears telling me the story and 
it was so heartbreaking for me because I felt like before that situation with the Euros, I felt like things had gotten better. You know, it was, it was such a long time, five, six, seven years. And then I saw the Euros and the fans were, uh, let's just say they, they weren't intelligent enough to understand. And, and, and even looking at the, the, the Hungarian national team, they had a couple of black players in there. And I was sitting and I was looking at them and I was saying, these guys are probably going through hell. And fast forward to the interaction with this lady on, 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 on social media. And she is in tears telling me the story. And she's like, you know, I just wanted to reach out to you to tell you, continue doing what you're doing. Simple things like you coming and playing for Ferenc Varos, who's probably the biggest Hungarian club ever, um, playing with them. Um, it, 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 it helped. And, and, and I asked her, I was like, how did it help if these things are still going on? She, and, and she's like, people like you and the people who keep fighting and, and trying to make a difference. She said it does help because she thinks things would have been worse if not for, 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 for people like me and for players like who played on the Hungarian national team and whatnot. And again, it's heartbreaking, but again, we have to try to continue to educate these people to, 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 to teach them that again, it's okay. Because at the end of the day, I'm not the type of person who does not see color. I see color and I see the beauty in blue eyes. I see the beauty in blonde hair, but I also see the beauty in black skin. And the, it's only about, again, how you treat people. That's the most important thing, how you treat people, respect, you know? Um, try to put a smile on people's face and not try to do them wrong or injustices. And again, the wheels are turning when it comes to situations like that, in my opinion, a little bit too slow, but it's turning, it's, 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 it's positive. And probably the biggest part of the reason why I love Halifax Nova Scotia so much is because I don't want to say it's, ab it's absent there, but it's very minimal, almost absent. And that's why I love uh, Nova Scotia so much. Um, people are so welcoming, they're so honest, they're so truthful, they're so kind, they're so genuine. And I just, and, and, and again, that's part of the reason why it, anything happens at, 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 at the Wanderers or in Halifax, I, I, I might be the first responder. The other day we were, during COVID, I think we had a, a, a what was that last year? Yeah, I think we had a, a snowstorm and some branches fell down and I was on the phone with Matt Fieger and I was like, hey, I, I want to go out and help clean the streets, you know? because these people are genuine people. I love them to death. But he was like, obviously, he's like, no, yeah, that's too dangerous. Leave yeah. that for the professor. Well, even think about your first snowfall when you guys came and it was snow and you guys had to push the car out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love tired. it. I, <laughs> <I'm too tired. laughs> no, I love it. I, I really, really, really. Jan, I have it. a question for you. Uh, Irvin, um, uh, thanks so much uh, for sharing. Uh, your experience uh, traveling uh, abroad, uh, outside your country, outside your comfort zone, your language, your culture, and how sport uh, integrated your experience of, you know, like you said, how the world's now small, but how we're also interconnected, we're humans. Um, and uh, you're right, Trinidadians, um, I happen to have the privilege of knowing Trinidadians uh, well. Uh, my husband is a Trinidadian and I've been in your country uh, several times. And uh, I do have to say, uh, I feel Trinidad is a little bit of a secret in terms of how they integrate diversity. They have a really uh, awesome perspective uh, that is very eye-opening um, to a Westerner. Uh, so as a Westerner, uh, people are often put in boxes, there's labels, uh, you, you know, where do you come from is the first thing that come out of people's you know, mouth, even if you're from Alberta and you come to Canada, Nova Scotia, you're from away. So my question is, is that we have um, a lot and, you know, especially Mervyn, you know, Marvin, um, your experience coming from Kenya, going to New Brunswick, traveling from New Brunswick and then coming you know, to Nova Scotia. I think that you both have such a unique experience um, and eye-opening experience that maybe you could share to some of our listeners that are from our international community. So we have a lot of international students 
uh, that participate in the Rose School of Business in um, their learning and also trying to successfully land a position. And this could be their very first job that they ever had in Canada. So it's a completely different context, uh, working um, and going to school and maybe having uh, you know, English as your second language. And you're right, we are a very open and uh, welcoming uh, place. Uh, we're often known as friendly uh, as Canadians, but super friendly as Nova Scotians, even more friendlier, uh, if that's even possible. However, I have worked in immigration uh, on behalf of the immigration, a Nova Scotia Office of Immigration, uh, and doing settlement work in uh, Nova Scotia in rural environments. Uh, and sometimes we can be really, uh, we can be really, uh, what I want to say in the question is, we can be really uh, welcoming, but at the end of the day, sometimes that's just welcome to, you know, the workplace and you don't have to necessarily have a group of friends that are Trinidadian or Caribbean or African descent, you know, that you're looking for. So how would you give advice to students on the best way to integrate in terms of dealing with their challenges of language and assimilating to the culture, but also keeping their identity and also trying to you know, find their way, find their path, and and feel confident uh, about you know interviewing and and having something to offer because they certainly do. It's just sometimes I feel they often struggle and have challenges, and I would like just to hear some of your thoughts on that. For sure, I'll, I'll take that one off if you don't mind. And you know, in as we've been actually recording this, um, we just added somebody to our team. Um, his name is Jose Guevara, who's from Honduras, and. I just got the the Slack message um, of Dave Finnis and introducing him to our group. And um, he's taken the role of uh, partnerships coordinator and he's still in university at UMB and um, he's involved in getting players to the Olympics and qualifiers with an, you know, on your national team. And so like, this is just to say that um, to continue to, you know, push yourself in all avenues of life, you know, even if you're just, you're in the management program at Dow, there's there's opportunities in the community to be aligned on other initiatives. Um, you know, the other day there was the group that went outside of the library to support Ukraine. And there's there's so many opportunities to to just put yourself out there in the public and align with different community members and and show your vulnerability because we're all we're all humans, you know what I mean? And you never know who you're who you're going to meet. Um, and you never know who's going to be your future coworker. You never know who's going to be your future employer. You never know who's going to be somebody who you see at the game who bought a ticket. You don't know who's going to be the guy working, scanning the tickets at the gate. Like you don't really ever know. So it's really just good to put your best foot forwards um, every day when you go to grab a pint with your friends, you know, being respectful, being courteous, like all these things really go a long way when eventually you do get in front of somebody for an interview. You, know, you never know where they saw you prior to that interview, which might be the thing that actually gets them to hire you or, or um, promote, refer you um, or whatever it may be, you know, and we have all kinds of opportunities for the Wanderers. Like I'm, I'm currently hiring for game day roles um, for ticket scanners and, and box office staff and, and whatnot and, and come to a game. You know, and, and see the the diversity and in, in opinions, diversity, physical diversity you'll see at the Wanderers grounds is, is is incredible. You know, we you'll see the pride flag there, you'll see the Meemaw flag there, you'll see um, the Trinidadian flag there, you'll see all these different flags, and they're not just they're not just um, pieces of cloth. They're they're symbolizations of of our audience and and our global reach. Um, and that's not just for the Wanderers. There's so many different businesses like or schools like Dalhousie, you know, I'm sure if you guys kept log of where all your international students are from, you'd, you'd, you'd be like Jan, who's, you know, traveled to a hundred countries, you'd probably be doubled that, triple that. So I just really want to say that it's important to just act, use your moral values as a compass in your everyday lives, you know, and, and make sure that you're, you're, you're continuing to grow even through those values and through those those morals um, because the world is evolving. And, and as Jan said, you know, some of the things that happened in Hungary back then are still happening now, but they could have been worse if he didn't implement himself and, and take that risk to go there. Um, so take risks, um, you know, challenge, 
challenge yourself and your peers. If you see somebody saying something, doing something that's you don't think is right, say it. Don't be silent. Um, and all these little things go a long way in the long run. And um, yeah. I just want to quickly, before I hand over to Samantha to wrap up, is just reinforce one of the things you just said, Marvin. I think it relates to you know the initiative that you took and why why it's so wonderful is that you know you talked about that diversity in the fans and the stands and and over a couple of occasions I've gone to you know to Toronto in my life and I've been to Maple Leafs games and I've been to Raptors games and I've been to TFC games and sometimes I did you know both in a weekend. And there was no doubt that the TFC games captured the diversity of Toronto in a way that the Maple Leafs games didn't and the Raptors did as well. And so as an organization in Halifax, it's one when you kind of echo diversity in that, that, that soccer and the stands have that in a way that a lot of other sports didn't so that you took that advantage and saw that opportunity um, and then can use it actually as a platform to show it, not just talk about it. Um, was a was an awesome initiative and fits quite in with the whole come together from away because so many of the players do support so all that stuff was nicely tied up and uh, and and you know as a fan and, and as a season ticket holder I've you know enjoyed seeing those messages um, uh, come out of there definitely definitely and businesses aren't meant to just be you know banks and you know math and all these all those things are are great to get you in, in front of a person, but at the end of the day, you know, your coworkers will, will appreciate you as for your work, but also for the person that you are. You know, I think we've all been in, in different jobs where there's, there's people who go and they, they do their job, but those aren't the people you look forward to seeing on a daily basis. It's the people who are, you know, sharing their food and their culture and, you know, having potlucks and talking about their experiences. Those things are what make, um, working in, you know, diverse environments and going to um, schools like Dalhousie that really encompass that, that diversity it makes it worthwhile. Wow. Wow. Just wow. Um, I want to compare and contrast what you just said with two quick things I've heard from students. One is there's a, an employer whose sli uh, slogan is come as you are. And I effing love that because it's like, this is you, we celebrate you, we want you and the and what you bring. And contrast that to a question um, that a student asked me in the last couple of months. Um, they, um, Cindy just gave me some great stats. Um, we have 115 countries represented at Dal. 24% of our business students are international. Like you said, Marvin, we have so much depth and so much collective like authenticity and, and skills and passion and diversity and just everything to give. So when this student asked me, um, he was an is an international student who does not have an Anglophone name and asked me if he should change his name for his resume. I had to pause and very, very kindly say, first of all, I'm not sure I'm educated enough. I'm not sure if I should answer this as the be all end all authority, because I feel like answering that would be part of the problem. But I will tell you that your name is your name and your name is your power. And you leave your name on there because anybody that is too short-sighted to, to use Jan's words, uneducated, does not deserve you, does not deserve your skills. Come as you are. Your name is you and your name is your power. And that is fantastic. Thank you. Definitely. And I, I want to add, like, I, I'm lucky that my parents, my parents had to think about the, that, you know, I'm, I'm named Marvin after Marvin Gaye. Um, I have a sister, Donna, who's named after Donna Summers. And I have a sister, Diana, who's named after Diana Ross. And, and, um, you know, my parents grew up in Uganda and, and one of my oldest sister, Emma, the only one who isn't named after a singer, is named after um, her grandmother, Emma. My parents had to think about what the question that student just asked you is how will we protect our children because they knew that they were eventually going to travel and they knew that they would have to deal with other cultures and races so they chose they chose global icons um, that would be relative wherever we went and Marvin Gaye is a name that's known everywhere as Donna Summers Diana Ross and it's tough that they couldn't choose a name that was tribal or cultural um, in fear of that 
exact fear that that student had where maybe I won't even get an interview because they'll see through my name that I'm not Caucasian or not whatever. Um, and it's, it's, it's sad that people have to think about that, but I love your answer, Samantha. It's so true. Your name is your name. Your identity is your identity. And if you have to change your name to be employed somewhere, you probably don't want to work there. So be your true self, write down your name as it is, spell it the way it is and own it. And you'll be hired by some wares that actually values you as an individual. You'll go to a university like that house that values you and your international mindset and your international experience. And maybe you'll end up at the Wanderers because we value that too. And can I add uh, to that, Samantha, please? Uh, with uh, Management Career Services, you have uh, a career and, rec and recruitment coach who's there at your disposal to um, basically uh, book an interview uh, with them and, in, you know, like an actual appointment, a virtual appointment or in-person now that we have. And they can coach you through, uh, you know, how you're feeling about self-identification. And so self-identification, I'd like to add, is a very important part of employment. And so, and when we talk about diversity and inclusion, and so employers are asking these questions, if you affiliated with this group, or are you associated with this, uh, you know, particular, uh, this, you know, nomination of this group or that group. And the thing is, is that self-identification is very personal. And it's also uh, something that students need to get more education on, quite frankly, on what that means to them personally, what that means if they're actually identifying and what that means. And, and so why I'm saying that is that when a person comes to you or a, a student and says, uh, you know, maybe our Asian students quite often have what we call Canadian nicknames in business. And so they do use their nickname in the middle of their uh, uh, resume, um, you know, to uh, have a, a, what we call a Canadian context name so that a, an employer could identify it through an interview or something. That's completely uh, optional, but I think you're right. Your name is your power. However, students do have to navigate within the Canadian context and they often find there's different challenges. And so I just wanted to say that if you're coming, students are coming across those challenges, they have support available for them uh, to be able to navigate uh, the various questions in the International Center uh, that we have at Dow is also really awesome, um, being able to support them with work permits and different things like that. But I'm just saying it is a real issue and it is a real concern. And I remember when I worked outside the university, if you had a, a resume with a uh, address of Godigan Street, you were by you were possibly felt that you were discriminated against. And maybe not get the job because then someone might make a determination about color of skin and different things like that. So people will find biases and they will find ways, um, you know, to discriminate in terms of a resume. But you're right. In today's society, you have to show up and be who you are, because at the end of the day, that's who you authentically need to continue uh, your journey as a career. Uh, and that means all of you, not just part of you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And that's one of um, one of the many reasons and one of the many things we briefly like we talked about in our original, you know, you being the inspiration for this is, you know, there's so many resources at Dal, uh, and it's so important uh, to be able to, you know, in that moment, I, I really wish I would have, you know, thought about that. So now I know uh, and I'm educating myself about the different resources that I can both answer the students question because, you know, they came to me and then also, you know, help them get the tools that they need in the professionals. Um, so thank you. All right, we are, we have just a little bit more time. So thank you so much to our guests for being generous uh, to go over a little bit. I wanted to go to our call to action points now. So Jan, I'm going to go to you first. And then Marvin, if you wouldn't mind following up. Jan, where do you see the wanderers going or evolving um, over the next five or so years? Sorry, I really love that question. Um, I've said this on the night of May 4th, 2019. Was that the home opener, Marvin? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. I've said this to a small audience who was there after the home opener, myself, Stephen, Stephen Hart, that is. I think Derek Martin was there. Um, Matt Fegan as well. 
and a couple others. Halifax Wanderers has the potential to become as iconic as BMO Field in Toronto. It has the potential to become one of the biggest football venues in the country. And I say that without any reservations because we have every single thing if not for big. us to become, yeah, if not bigger, for us to become really huge. Um, I think, and I don't want to go into too much of the football inside, but I think we, especially with some of the additions, obviously I've not seen them yet, I'll see them soon. We have the potential to win a CPL title. And if that happens, along with the World Cup that is coming to, to United States, Canada, and Mexico in 2026. Halifax, Nova Scotia is going to be huge, and the Wanderers is probably going to be one of the biggest clubs in the country. Um, we have to be careful with how we continue to develop the team because we have an identity at the club. The club is almost like a family. If you're inside, it, it, from the groundsmen to the horses in the stable behind the Wanderers ground, to the fans, to, to the cameraman who comes through, uh, everybody um, is like a small family. So we have to be careful to ensure that we maintain that bond, that love, that togetherness that we have, that family setting that we have. But as long as we maintain that and we continue to develop and to improve upon the other aspects of, of the club, I think we will become massive, uh, massive, as big as probably the Toronto Raptors or the uh, massive. That's my, that, that's, that's, that's what I see for the club and for the organization. Um, I actually was on a call with, with our vice president Vice President recently, Matt, Matt Fegan. And I told him, I was like, I just want to be here when that happens because I'm fortunate enough to be the only person who has seen every single Wanderers game live, all, everyone um, in the organization. And like I told him, I just want to be here when it does happen. I would probably give it another uh, two to three years, but it can be sooner. And I'm hoping it's sooner. But We'll be a big organization. We'll continue to grow. We have the right leadership at the club. We have the right man at the helm, Derek, who's doing a fantastic job um, as the president. Um, we have the best fans in the league. We have, we have everything. We have the infrastructure, the community. The fact that the stadium, the Wanderers Ground, is walking distance from downtown is so ideal, you know? Um, so... Next five years, I think we'll be massive. We'll be um, a breeding ground for big clubs in the world, big European teams uh, to come and to, to take players from and to move them on to go on to bigger, better leagues. Um, we'll be developing young players. We'll be taking players from, from, from Dal, from SMU, um, university players who want to progress and go into the game. Uh, we also have an under-23 program coming out in the summer for younger players, um, a team that 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 we'd have traveling throughout the summer and playing games, gaining experiences and, and just developing themselves and, and enjoying their, 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 their life through sport. And yeah, for me, the club is going to be massive in the next five years. Um, for me, the, the, the biggest club in, 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 in Canada. Completely agree. Completely agree. And, um, you know, to elaborate on that, we're, we're already taking steps to go there. And, and one thing that I, I, I hope and know will happen is we'll continue to be a family because what happens with a lot of organizations is as they get bigger, um, they get more corporate and you lose that family vibe to it where you don't know everyone's name in the office. You know, you don't know who's in all those different positions. And I really love that about our club is, you know, you said the photographer, his name's Trevor McMillan. He's incredible. You know, our 
our lead physiotherapist, Danielle McNally, um, you know, our safety officer, Mike Laloon. Um, there's so many people who are integral to what we do um, and are going to continue to contribute. And all those people that I named have international ties as well. You know, Danielle McNally's husband um, just came back from the Olympics. Um, you know, like that's that's wild. But um, Mike Laloon has has been to a ton of different FIFA um, stadiums um, to bring back um, his ideas and helped us through COVID when um, we had to create social distance venues and probably the, the toughest thing I've ever had to do. I'll be honest, I spent like two weeks working like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. just trying to get figure it all out. How is this going to work so we can maximize the capacity to get as many people into that place as we can, given the always evolving government restrictions. Um, so in five years, um, I think we will. We will be massive in not only in in, in size and in stadium and in impact and, and in reach. Um, you know, before this call, I had a call with Jill Ellsworth from CBU. She does all their social media and marketing and some of their community engagements. And I was trying to get some ideas of how we can help them because we're really trying to expand our, our community, not just the HRM, but, you know, we're getting to Cape Breton, we're getting New Brunswick, we're getting, um, the other day I looked at insights for the Together for Change podcast that I do, and we're already in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, um, Australia. The only one we're not really is Asia and Antarctica. Like that's that's mind blowing already, right? Um, I had a call yesterday with this guy Christopher from Seed, which is Society for Enterprise Education and Development, who we're working with to make sure we continue to have um, youth working at the games from all walks of life, and we're turning one corner of our section, um, the 101, 102 sections for anyone's familiar and one of our corners near the Museum of Natural History there um, into a family corner. And, and what that looks like is um, it was inspired by the guy from the Toronto Raptors, uh, I think it's Vijay Singh is his name, um, who has donated personally like $300,000 like almost every year to force uh, youth of different ethnicities, genders, and races to sit together. And that's what we're now creating in that corner. We have we have five club partners who are all having their tickets in, in the 102 section. We're going to have um, the option for them to, you know, send out reduced ticket costs to some of their, their, their players. Though. So the people who sign up for their clubs from their youth programs to coaches and everything. Um, Brigadoon um, has become a partner with us who's taken over that whole corner. And if you're not familiar with Brigadoon, they, they work with children's youth camps and they empower the youth through different, different types of camps each month. Um, so that whole corner now, the venue is dedicated to youth and families. And, you know, we're looking to partner with ISANS um, to get them involved. We're, we're always looking to grow and adapt with our community and we're welcoming of everybody. And that is just some of the things we're doing now um, to make sure that we, as we grow, we're keeping that family vibe. And, and personally, I have an ambition that I wanna be like the Drake of the club, the global ambassador, um, because I wanna keep growing that vision and I wanna keep working, um, traveling one day to, to, to continue to align on these, on these, these um, goals and, and our mission to bring the, community together through sport and we're starting locally but we're, we're aiming globally and uh, uh, sorry just because cindy's mentioned about gotagen and i'll date myself a bit and i think it was the doughboys but i have no idea they used to have a song that was sung about the gotagen street and it was an awesome song and i live off lady hammond and when i heard why it's called lady hammond for all the reasons that you say there's a part of me I just like in the future that I could say I live off Gottagen because Gottagen was a cool street in my mind because of the song and Lady Hammond sounds like freaking awful. And so it'd be nice if they just called the whole damn street Gottagen because it's super confusing to be on Gottagen and then all of a sudden for no apparent reason, it's something different. So I'm hoping that one day they would kind of remove that and just make Gottagen one big again uh because that would be kind of uh, nicer so no one's worried about which street they live and what that represents 
Um, Thanks for adding that there. Yeah. Uh, Godigan used to be uptown and there was downtown and uptown and it was hopping and uh, not to say that it's not hopping now, but uh, there's a lot of different uh, situations that are happening with that community. And so I've worked on that community on that street for almost seven years. So uh, I'm, it's, it's like a second home to me for sure. Uh, and there's lots of community involvement and integration uh, in that one, uh, no, two blocks basically. But a very dynamic community and and very um, you know under un, under um, what's the word not really recognized for uh, you know for how, how connected and how uh, strong they really are unfortunately. I love that we have a capsule in time which can captures somebody who has seen every single Wanderers game uh, and. You know, we can take the journey, you know, up some outsiders, some <laughs> insiders, but we can really be a community together and, you know, watch and cheer and see this, you know, our community here become an international, uh, international sensation. Or is that Pitbull? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, um, listen, there's no reason why that, why that can't be possible. And I'm really, really, I know that that will happen. And I, nobody should ever bet against anybody on this call, especially uh, Marvin and Jan. So with that, our last question, uh, we'll go to Marvin first and then to Jan. Uh, closing advice to students. Um, and you can be thinking of advice that you would want to give them um, now, or perhaps something you would have told yourself kind of earlier on in your career, some advice that you wish you would have heard you can take this any direction. Yeah. Um, one is honestly just bet on yourself. Um, there's, there's so, this has only happened for me in the last three years where I walk into a room thinking and feeling and knowing I belong in that room. And the sooner you do that, the sooner other people will believe you belong in that room. And it's, it really starts with yourself. Um, and it's important that you, in all the ways we've talked about being professional, you do your best to, to honor that and be, which a lot of it comes with respect, but bet on yourself and, and show up, um, do the work and believe that you belong where you are. It doesn't matter if it's, in a room with all your execs, your presidents, whatever, say what you have to say, say it with your chest and, and, and bet on yourself. And um, it's important to um, continue to learn, not just through your school, but through your, through your community as well. Um, I took entrepreneurship courses that were available and we were living in Sackville. I've taken, um, I got my coaching licenses um, as an offer to our Candy Games team because they wanted to uh, make sure that there was more coaches who were knowledgeable in the sport to be able to do it. So we were given this advanced weekend course and I could have seen it as, oh, I want that weekend off. But I was like, no, I'm going to be able to use that someday. So I took that weekend and I was able to get all three licenses, which usually are a weekend of their own. Um, and it would have been three weekends, but we got it all compressed. So take those opportunities to learn um, because you never know where they'll take you. Sounds good. Sounds good, Mark. Um, I like, I like Komaziwa. I heard that today and I really like it. I would just like to add on that. Um, unless you're a shitty person, then probably you should stay home. <laughs> but um, yeah, Komaziwa, I like that. That would be my advice, just come as you are. Because um, we need more people, you know? I think everybody now is trying to be like everybody else, which kind of makes everybody the same. But um, we need more individuals. We need more unique characters, people who are not afraid to be themselves and to show the world how how beautiful it could be when you be yourself, you know? So yeah, come as you are. Thank you. Watching each of you come as you are, I have no doubt will give, will help empower our management learners to come as they are, no doubt. Marvin, Jan, 
Derek and Cindy, thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we, we know that Derek and Cindy are likely a little bit easier to get a hold of. So that's why we asked um, ahead of time, uh, Marvin, you agreed for us to link uh, your LinkedIn and your email down below. And Jan, we understand that you, the best way for management learners to get a hold of you is via Instagram. We'll also link that in the description. Um, I just want to say from the bottom, top, middle, from all of my heart, thank you so much for investing the time with us here today for our management learners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys for having us.